so we're here, we're here today to talk about transmedia, um, and um, the the thing about transmedia is that it's a relatively new term. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this um, from a personal perspective. Um, I'm going to talk about alternate reality games, um, and to do that, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you back to 2001. Now, 2001 was nine years ago, um, so I'm going to start with the easy stuff. Um, but online, in on the internet in 2001, I want you to imagine and see if you can remember what it was like, because in 2001 there was no YouTube. There was no Facebook, there was no Flickr, there was no Twitter, there was no Wikipedia in 2001. I have no idea how we even knew anything <laughs> back in 2001. Where would we look things up? Um, so, this was, so, so this was an internet world without Wikipedia. In the UK, in 2001, consumers were starting to get their very first broadband connections at the blistering speed of 512 kilobits per second for a 24-7 connection. And in 2001, I was in Cambridge. I was studying for the finals of my law degree. Um, this is a photo of where I was at in Cambridge. I was at Gonville and Keys College. And um, just behind that church there, that was where my room was in my third year. And I was doing things like, so this is Easter 2001, and I was busy writing my dissertation on the ethics of stem cell research. I was busy reading textbooks about legal history, international law, and boring stuff like trusts, and trying to procrastinate really hard. But it was all going to be for a good thing, because I was going to become a lawyer. <laughs> and I was going to make my parents, who are Chinese immigrants from Hong Kong, I was going to make them very, very proud, because I was going to have a stable job and be very serious. <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that I am a, I'm a geek. I'm a geek who's also really good at procrastinating. And the problem is, is that if you're a geek who's really good at procrastinating, then the worst thing you can do is give that geek a 10 megabit always on internet connection <laughs> where they live. So the problem was, was that back in Easter 2001, I was watching this. So this is the trailer to a movie called AI, Artificial Intelligence. It's based on a short story by Brian Aldiss, a British science fiction author. Um, it's called Super Toys Last All Summer Long. Um, it's a fantastic short story, uh, some of the best science fiction that you'll read ever. Um, you know, brain expanding, consciousness expanding stuff, all about the nature of what it means to be a human, the heartache, and the loss of what it could mean to be a parent as well. You know, really meaty stuff. Uh, Stanley Kubrick had signed on to develop the movie. And when Kubrick passed away, Steven Spielberg picked it up. And you can still read the story online now. Um, it was first published in 1997 by Wired magazine in issue 5.01. Now, the thing about this trailer was that something weird happened toward the end. And I'm going to see if you can spot it, because it happens near the credits. The thing that happened was right here. Because when you're watching a movie trailer, and then it comes to the credits at the end, you know what Steven Spielberg does, right? He's the director. Okay, I know what Michael Kahn does. He's the film editor. I know what a film editor does, right? I know what, uh, let's pick another one. Bob, Bob Ringwood is the costume designer. He designs costumes, right? Okay, you, you're with me so far. We're not really taxing any brain cells. But Janine Saller, she is a sentient machine therapist. And she's been credited in this movie and it's 2001, and I am a proto-internet geek. So I do the first thing I do, because I don't want to be revising for my exams, and I Google for Janine Saller. <laughs> and the problem was, was that Janine was a real person, or at least as real as you could be online, because she had her own website. Totally normal. She had her own site, just like anyone else would. She had a job at Bangalore World University in New York. Uh, she had her faculty page 
at Bangalore World University. And if you have a faculty page that lists your research, then you also have your contact details. And if you have contact details, then you call up the phone number, because by this time, you know, you're procrastinating really, really hard. <laughs> so I left Dr. Sala a voicemail. She wasn't in her office. Um, and I emailed Dr. Sala. I got her out-of-office vacation autoresponder. But what this was, was that, you see, Janine was really worried about her friend, Evan, Evan Chan, because something weird had happened with him. They grew up together. They went to, they, they went to college together. Evan was a really, really dear friend of hers. And Evan had died recently in somewhat disturbing circumstances. And what we had here was the beginning of a fantastic rabbit hole of something, of, of a drama that told a wonderful story in kind of like the eddies and currents of these characters that were split across multiple platforms, real life events. You know, I could find out about all these characters. There were puzzles that could be solved, all fractured and splintered across multiple media and told in such a beautiful way and executed perfectly over the next few months. And whenever you have something like that, whenever you had wonderful storytelling, then you started to get communities forming around it. And this was the biggest community that was going through that narrative. It was called Cloudmakers. Cloudmaker was the name of Evan Chan's yacht, where he was last seen alive. And because this is 2001, we had a mailing list, because that's how we shared information with people in 2001. And I looked after this thing called The Trail, which was a static piece of HTML that I would update every day while I was supposed to be revising. And it had all the hyperlinks inside it. It was just one, basically one long word document. Everything we know so far about why Evan Chan died. 6,000 members of this mailing list. People all over the world speculating about what had happened, what was going to happen next. How could we, how could we help Janine and her daughter, Lyra, figure out what had happened to Evan? And when you get communities like that, you get the smaller versions of them. So this is a chat room, which we had in 2001. It's a bit like Twitter, but more reliable. <laughs> um, and, and sometimes doesn't you know, precipitate revolutions in Middle Eastern countries. Um, this is a screenshot of the IRC chat room called Evan Chan, named after Evan Chan. And this is a screenshot that I took two days ago. And there are still people in there, nine years later. At its peak, we had around 150 people in there. That was a wonderful water cooler moment. People all around the world trying to figure out what was going to happen. They're still there. We're having our 10-year reunion next year. We're all going to get together. Because when you have those people together in a really, really intense environment trying to figure out what happens next, then those are real people. They're talking to each other. And they can form real relationships which is how I met my wife in that chat room. And that's why I think I know a little bit about transmedia. <laughs> so I was going to talk about play today um, and what that means. Because I think in the last nine years, we have seen since that AI campaign, since that beast, since the model that a lot of people have copied since then, I'm worried that we're seeing some anti-patterns. A lot of people are copying what happened there, which no doubt about it was absolutely fantastic and told a wonderful story, but it did it for a specific audience. It did it for internet geeks like me, who love science fiction movies and read sites like Ain't It Cool News. And I'm very worried that the wrong lessons have been learned. And I want to explore that a bit through the nature of play. So when I talk about daring to play, what does that really mean? Well, play is kind of like what happens when you have um, creativity, when you're inventive, when you're a kid. Who's seen Toy Story 3? Stick up your hand if you've seen Toy Story 3. Right. Um, there's two wonderful scenes in this movie, and they involve Andy, uh, both when he's older and, and when he's younger, and they involve a new character, a new girl called Bonnie. And Bonnie's a really young girl as, girl as well. And there are these gorgeous scenes where they've got all their toys lined up. And they're not part of a set. They've got Woody and Buzz and a dinosaur and Mr. Potato Head. And they're coming up with these wonderful scenarios. 
And it's that kind of inventiveness and that kind of creativity that I want to get to when I'm saying, where has all the play gone? So one of the things that we learned over the last nine years was that if we take great storytelling, what happens, rather, if we take great storytelling and we add that sense of creativity and that sense of inventiveness and we add a little bit of game mechanics to that, what can we do with something like that? Well, at one of the startups that I was at, I helped design this game called Perplex City, which is a big worldwide alternate reality game. And the things that we got to do with that were amazing. When we, when we killed off a character in Perplex City, we got 333 paper cranes sent to our office to commemorate that character's death. We didn't ask for that. But that was the culture that we inculcated, that we incubated in that community around that. And because of the types of things that we were getting people to do, like band together and write programs that would crack military-grade encryption, later on, at Six to Start, my brother and I were asked to put together a game called Smokescreen. And what Smokescreen was, was a drama that would teach 14 to 19-year-olds in the UK through the medium of games, through the medium of play, and played out through a social network, what it means to explore privacy and identity online. Because these are really important issues that young people, not just young people, everyone really, needs to be more aware about and could learn more about. But the thing that I'm really worried about, because all this means is that for the last three to five years, I've been banging on at people going, look, wouldn't it be great if we get people playing more? Games are fantastic. And Christy talked a little bit about this earlier today in her talk when she was talking about the rise of gamification. You know, the, the final triumph of the game nerds who've been waiting 30 years to be finally noticed. And then we get articles like this in Fortune, playing to win the game-based economy where game mechanics will fix everything for you. All right? Or things like this. There's a startup out in the States called Scavenger which has a game mechanic playbook. 50 rules for how you gamify something. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think what we need to recognise is that when we reduce something, when we say, if you just take the game mechanics and you add them to your arbitrary business or your piece of entertainment, that doesn't make it fun. That's like taking a painting by numbers course and comparing it to a Monet. Or following instructions in a chemistry lesson go, yes, I know how to cook now and I can bake really well. Because there's an art to it. And that difference is the difference between play and games. Because when we blindly apply those game mechanic principles, all we're really doing is we're addicting people to something. We're making them come back. And they're not quite sure why, but they need to play Farmville one more time. And if they want to play Farmville one more time and they don't know why, then they start to resent it. <laughs> so... When I talk about daring to play, I mean things like this. When you have a giant bucket of Lego and you're just sitting there and there are no rules and there are no constraints and there are no goals, that's when you're playing. When you start layering stuff on top of that, then that's when you start to have a game. But these are two very different things. And I think that stuff like fan fiction is play as well. Because then what you're taking is instead of Lego bricks, you're taking the tiniest kind of mimetic objects of culture. You are taking the Enterprise from Star Trek and, the, um, and a Star Destroyer or the Death Star from Star Wars. And you're saying, which one would win in a fight? That's playing with bits of culture. Writing Harry Potter fan fiction is playing with bits of culture. And the wonderful, interesting thing about that is through that process of play, someone ends up telling a story. So what I want everyone to do and think about when they're thinking about creating a transmedia property or a piece of entertainment that has transmedia characteristics to it is please, for the love of God, try and make it fun and try and put the play back into it. I really don't want to see any of this that I'm going to show you. Now, these lists... Are from something are from a talk that I gave about three to four years ago, and I'm still seeing this stuff, right? I don't want to see 
<laughs> viewing source code in any transmedia experience that comes out of this room. Because that is work. I don't want to do anything called de-stegging. Do you know what de-stegging is? It is not a bizarre deviant sexual practice. <laughs> Destegging is what happens through the practice of steganography, which is hiding information inside another thing. So if I take a photograph, and then I can use steganography to hide a message inside of that. And destegging is taking that information back out. That is work. That's not fun. That's not playing. That is a chore. That is what people are paid to do inside the CIA. <laughs> which also is what code breaking is. There's easy code breaking. Now, that can be fun. But if you're just sticking a puzzle in something and saying, right, you have to break this code now. Frankly, I'm at that stage in my life right now where I can't be bothered. Not more code breaking, not more source code. And, and ultraviolet torches, right? What is up with ultraviolet torches and hidden messages and code where I have to shine a light on something to, start, to try and figure out what's happening? I don't want to do any of that anymore. In fact, I don't want to do any of this stuff. I don't want to help any more teenage girls. <laughs> I don't want to help brunette teenage girls specific. Actually, I don't want to help attractive brunette teenage girls who can't remember what's going on and may have a secret object secreted somewhere around their person that they need your help. Big wide eyes into webcam on YouTube. Please click like. I don't want to help those teenage girls anymore because that is lazy storytelling. And the order is probably after that teenage girl. There must be many, many orders around the world by now. I don't want to do any of that. I don't want to have to follow so many Twitter accounts that I don't know what's going on. And there's this thing about platform excitement. Just because there is an infinite variety of platforms for us to deploy our stories and our experiences on right now. In fact, there are all the ones that already exist. And we have the luxury of inventing any one we want now. We shouldn't be using them just because they're there. So I want to end with a suggestion, because I've told you what I don't ever want to see ever again. And I don't want to have to give that section of my talk again in three years' time. <laughs> so I have a thought experiment for you. The AI game, that beast experience, came out in 2001 for a science fiction movie that had a very defined target audience. You know, based on a science fiction story, Stanley Kubrick, Steven Spielberg, Ain't It Cool News, we, we know the guys did a really great job at reaching the audience for the film. But there was another movie that came out in 2001 that could have had the same treatment. And that movie was Amelie. Amelie was a wonderfully quirky film, wonderful characters, really interesting world. What if, instead of making a geeky science fiction themed game. And I say that with the utmost respect, being a geeky guy who loves science fiction. But what if, instead of making something for that audience, something had been made for the kind of people who liked this film? What would you make for the people who would have visited the sites who would have been interested in this kind of thing? That's what I want to leave you with. Thank you. Thank you very much.